Uh, my name's Gary. I'm obviously not Pastor Vinny. I'm filling in for him today. Uh, he asked 20 other people. None of them were available, so you got me. So um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening in the world um, because I noticed a few weeks ago on the Internet, I noticed there was this new campaign out there, and it was called Love Don't Judge. Anybody see that at all? Well, if you haven't, it's a good thing. Um, because basically what love don't judge is doing is promoting all kinds of things that society has always said were wrong. Absolutely wrong. Everybody knew they were wrong. But now they're promoting that they're okay. And even if you don't think they're okay, you shouldn't judge. You should just love them. Um, and so I thought I had to comment about that because that sounds so great. Love don't judge. But it's wrong. Uh, I was thinking about a time when I was a teenager and I was going to high school and I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, I know some of you who know me would laugh at the idea of me being a vet, but that was my goal, I was going to be a veterinarian. Uh, and so I had to take advanced classes in high school, and one of them was an advanced biology class. And so I wasn't a great student, but I wasn't a bad student, but I really never studied. I told people it all came in as osmosis, you know? <laughs> Biology, I just had to sit there and it would just soak in. So I didn't study a lot and I did okay, but this one test came along and I hadn't studied at all because I was so good at osmosis. And I'm sitting down at the test and I'm reading it and one of the essay questions said, explain in detail how the kidneys produce urine. Now, we all know what urine is. But because I hadn't studied for the test, and because the teacher wrote very messy, I actually read it as, explain in detail how the kidneys produce wine. <laughs> well, you can imagine my, my shock at learning that the kidneys produce wine. How did I miss that material? But I sat there and then I proceeded to write an amazing essay explaining how the kidneys produce wine and to make sure that the teacher knew how confident I was in this material, I ended it with a nice big bold all caps and that's how the kidneys produce wine. <laughs> well, when the tests were handed back out, much to my surprise, I got the test back and the Thing said I had an F with seven minuses after it. <laughs> and when he handed me the test, he said, Mr. Bisa, you owe me points on the next test. That's how bad I did. <laughs> well, let me just say that was a wake-up call for me in realizing that osmosis in school didn't necessarily work all the time. So I had to start studying for stuff. So the wake-up call pointed out the idea that in grading, what are we doing? We're testing and then we're judging, right? Now, if he hadn't judged my work as deficient, I would have continued to go through osmosis all through college, probably not because I would have never made it through, but I would have gone through that, but the judgment told me I needed to change. Recently, I read an article that a teacher in Florida was fired from her job because she gave a student a zero because he didn't hand in the work. She was fired because the district's policy is that you can only give a 50%. It's the lowest grade you can give. And so they fired her because she refused to give a 50 for something that the student didn't hand anything in. But that's the society we live in today. We shouldn't judge. Everybody does good work. Everybody's okay. But that's not the way it works. You see, the world says, love don't judge. Scripture says, judge don't love. Or judge but love. Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, that's why I'm a substitute. <laughs> but we're supposed to judge, but we're still, we're supposed to judge, but we're supposed to love in our process of judging. The world has lost sight of that. Some Christians have lost sight of that as well. Pastor's been talking recently about 
um, the different characteristics of God. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the traits of God that I saw. And so today we're going to look at a few traits of God and how they apply to this concept of love don't judge. The first one I want to look at is love. Because, you know, everybody who's not a believer and everybody who is a believer loves the concept of God is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone loves, has been born of God, and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Hey, right? Everybody loves that concept of God. God is love. If God was a cafeteria or a golden corral, everybody would be lined up at that one booth that had love. They'd be dishing that up on the plate like crazy. Yes? Everybody loves the idea of love. God is love. But what does that mean? We know what it means to love someone, but does, what does it mean to be love? Love is a really funny thing, you know. I mean, our concept, humans' concept of love is conditional. Do you understand that? Our concept of love is conditional. I will love you if you do these things. I love you because of this. Yes? I love my wife because she's incredibly beautiful and she puts up with me. Right? We all have these reasons why we love. The problem is that when we love conditionally and the person no longer meets that condition, we stop loving them then. The reason divorce is rampant in America is because we're conditionally loving people. When I married my wife, I said, till death do us part, not until she decided that she wasn't doing certain things. Amen. As Christians, we do the same thing. That's why divorce is on the rise, in, in, even in Christianity. Because humans love conditionally. Praise God. Love, God's love isn't like that at all. God loves us unconditionally. The closest thing we can come to is a concept of being a parent. We love our children because of who they are, not necessarily because of what they're doing. I can tell you there's been times, if my kids see this, don't pay attention. I can tell you there's been times where I loved my child because of who they were positionally to me, but I didn't like them because of what they were doing. We love conditionally, but we love our kids because they're our kids. That's the closest we can come to understanding the concept of unconditional love. What's cool about God is that he loved us even when we rejected him. We rejected him pretty much at birth, but God says, I love you, I want you, I need you. You know, when your child runs away or they're doing some things and they reject you, I don't know if any of you have had that happen, but your kids want nothing to do with you. Or they're in so deep in sin that you don't know what to do except pray. But you know, you tell your child, I have an open ticket for you to come home. An open airplane ticket, all you need to do is take it Come home, I'll accept you back. I don't care what you've been doing, I love you. That's what God did. He had an open ticket for us. But we have to accept the ticket and come home. Romans 5 8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Unconditional love. We didn't do anything to earn it. We hadn't changed our way. We have this concept so many times that we have to change before we can come to Christ. We have to do this before this. And that's not the way it is at all. God loves us just the way we are. He may not like what we're doing, but he loves us just the way we are. You notice there was no condition in that statement. He loved us even when we were sinning. It doesn't say he loved us because we stopped doing this or we stopped doing that. He loved us just the way we are. God is love. 
He's so different from our human love that it's un, hard to understand. When, God, when it says God is love, it's defining love. That's what love should look like. All right, another trait, because I told you I'd give you a bunch. Ben said my message was going to be too long. Originally, it was like 10 pages long, and I said, I don't think they'll make it. So Ben suggested I do it, my message, kind of like one of those closing statements on an advertisement. But wait, there's more. Um, so there is more. I have more traits for you today. The next trait is holy. I think we understand the concept of God is holy. Think about scriptures. What do we see? We even sang a song that had to do with holy. Revelation 4, 8 says, each of the four living creatures had six wings, was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. But what does it mean, holy? We have this you know, when you talk to non-believers, non-Christians, you say holy, it's kind of like, ooh, looks like something out of the, the show Ghosts or something, you know, ooh, holy. Yeah. But what does it mean when we talk about holy? It means completely and totally without sin. Pure. God is without sin. Not only is without sin, but James tells us he can't even be associated with sin. He says he doesn't tempt us, nor can he be tempted. So we see God loves us, but he's holy. That's an issue. Matthew, I believe it is, says that there's a gulf that separates us. God's on one side, we're on the other. God is holy, he can't have anything to do with us because we're sinful, that's a problem. You have a holy, sinless God on one side and sinful man on the other. And yet, God created us. Why? To have, an, to have a love relationship with us. Can you imagine? What is it like to have a love relationship? We know what it means, right? But imagine having a love, an intimate love relationship with someone who loves you no matter what. Wow. That's why we were created, an intimate love relationship. And yet the sin in our life prevents us from having that relationship. And when I say sin in our lives, everybody in here knows what I'm talking about. Probably some of you, it pops right into your mind. Deep down, we all know we're sinners. We all know we've done something wrong. You know, Catholicism, I don't mean to pick on Catholicism because I've got friends who are Catholics, but when I grew up Catholic, there was a concept of this. Sin on one side, good on the other. Yes? Did you grow up with that concept? And I don't think it's strictly because I grew up Catholic, because I love my friends who are Catholics. But the concept of sin on one side of the scale and good on the other, and my good has to outweigh the sin, it doesn't work. Because no matter how much I do, it's never going to make me pure and holy and sinless. Yes? We've all sinned. Okay, the next trait I want to talk about then is righteous. Do you know that in Romans, Paul uses the word righteous more than 30 times? 30 times, just in the book of Romans. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile, for in the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is faith from first to last, just as is written, the righteous will live by faith. The word righteous is important for us to understand. The dictionary means it's free from guilt or sin.
To be righteous means you are without guilt or sin. That's why Paul uses it so much, because he's trying to illustrate what happens when you come to Christ. You're no longer guilty of sin because of what Christ did on the cross. That's why he uses that word so much. Here's an important thing. Before we are guilty due to the righteousness of God, after we come to Christ, we are righteous because of our faith in God. You see the contrast? We were, righteous, we were guilty because of God's righteousness, but now when we come to Christ, we are righteous, sinless, because of what Christ did. The most important part of understanding what this means is that we understand that the righteous God of the universe is just. In fact, the Hebrew word for righteous can be equated to the word justice. So it says that God is a just God. Think about if we had a God who was not fair. Yeah. Parents, you all know, your kids think that you love the other child more than that one. Right? I mean, my kids grew up and they insisted that I love this one more than this one. You know, parents do tend to have favorites, although we deny it. <laughs> but, you know, the reality is, imagine if God had favorites. But he says he treats us without favor. There is no favor in God's eyes. He loves us. He treats us fairly impartially that's a good thing so let's review what we've gotten so far I want to make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself here nope I got ahead mercy is the next one like I say I only do this once in a while so mercy is the next one mercy means to withhold punishment where it is deserved. Think about it. When we read that God who is great in mercy made us alive because of it, that's a compelling statement. You see, the might, you might summarize the mercy of God as a natural desire to pardon. God has a natural desire to pardon and forgive. You know, sometimes when you hear trials, you'll hear that uh, a criminal is all upset because the judge they got is known to be harsh. You know, no mercy, that judge. You know, he throws the book at him. And then you'll hear some other criminal who's like, yeah, we got so-and-so. Because he's known to be very lenient. He's, he treats everybody nicely, right? There's no impartiality in judgments in the courts. I like to think of, um, you know, God is a God of nature, of mercy. I like to think of all these different traits we've talked about, almost like water. You know, we look at water, and everybody knows water when you see it. Whether it's ice, whether it's steam, whether it's water, nobody's going to mistake ice for something other than water, right? Everybody sees steam coming out of, steam, out of a kettle, you know it's water. We understand that this one thing has multiple characteristics about it. It's the same with God. He has all these characteristics. Sometimes we don't remember that he's got all these characteristics. Let's review. We said God is love, unconditional, unchanging. He loves us with an everlasting love. God is holy. He's pure, sinless, totally separated from sin. God is righteous. He judges fairly and consistently without partiality. And he's merciful. He has great compassion on his people and desires the pardon. That's the nature of God. That's what I see. I'm not a Bible scholar, so you can take it up with Pastor Vinny. <laughs> Going back to love, don't judge, that uh, ignores the very nature of God. It would be impossible for God to love but not judge because it's against his nature. He must judge. Most people who talk about God, they cite the love of God. You know, 
I don't see anybody at the Golden Corral lined up at the holiness buffet. Oh, give me a double portion of that holiness. You know, they're all lined up at that love portion. The problem is that if we only look like that, we fall into the concept that the world often has about the love of God. They'll say, oh, God would never send people to hell because he loves us. Well, that would be true if it was only love. They don't understand all the other pieces of this. The righteous judgment of God is that sin deserves punishment. And the fair, impartial judgment of God is that that sin deserves death. That's, that's just the way it is. A holy God can have nothing to do with sin. The righteous God has judged sin to be serious and it demands death. So there's the problem. Because now we're back to the God who created us for an intimate love, an intimate love relationship has this heavy burden on him that we're judged guilty and must be punished by death. But it's pretty cool. Because it doesn't stop there. God had a plan. How do I solve this dilemma? I created Terry for an intimate love relationship. But Terry has sinned. I have to punish her. That punishment is death. I've left myself no way out. What do I do? There's another portion of scripture, though, that we can look at. There's more, as they say. But wait, there's more. Here is a secret of God's nature. James, 12, James 2, 12 through 13 says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful, but mercy triumphs over judgment. You see what that says? Mercy triumphs over judgment. God's mercy set in motion a plan for how can I satisfy all these things? How? Can I solve the problem of having to punish the one I love so much? Mercy sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. The sinless Lamb of God. The, one, the only one who could satisfy the requirements of the very nature of God. His unconditional love said... I am going to sacrifice my son who is sinless to satisfy all the demands of my very nature so that I can restore the intimate relationship with my child. That's pretty exciting. So you have this God who loves us and he set this whole plan in motion. Think about the, verse, the, the slide we had up a little earlier. Before we are guilty due to the righteousness of God and after we are righteous because of our faith in God. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If we confess it with our lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. It has nothing to do with anything about us. The only thing that we have to do is believe. It's as simple as that. It's hard to imagine, but it's as simple as that. The amazing plan of God, set about by the mercy of God, is that I'll send my son to die on the cross for you.